Throughout history, religious ideology and belief in the supernatural have both helped and terrified human beings. For all the fear that Christianity has bestowed upon occultism, the practice itself isn't exactly harmful. In fact, it often serves as a spiritual experience for its practitioners, much like the belief in unorthodox deities such as Satan. Here are some strange and unusual occult practices from the past. Seances are an occult practices conducted by mediums, almost always with the intention of contacting the dead or persons who have crossed over to another plane. A French word seance translates to sitting in English, where practitioners would sit with spirits from another world. Usually practitioners sit in a circle of six to eight people, hold hands and attempt to diminish any distractions which may hinder their desired results of summoning the dead. Sometimes mediums report hearing otherworldly voices along with seeing ghosts manifest from another world. At times it is believed that ghosts speak through the medium. Reportedly, ghosts have used other instruments to write, such as a famed Yiji board or other pens or pencils that inscribe some communication on an object. As a focal point of the seance, the medium is believed to make otherworldly contact with the dead. Some reports claim that a medium levitated in the air during a seance, though it's doubtful that modern science has come up with any concrete evidence of such event actually happening. In the occult, symbolism carries a lot of meaning whether to connect us to hidden worlds or to awaken things that are unconscious. The pentagram, one of the more popular symbols in our culture today, has a rich history that dates back to ancient Babylon. The star represented the pattern that Venus seemingly made in the sky, as well as various beliefs. It has evolved to mean different things to different people. Sigils are basically signatures of various deities, other angels or demons. They are inscribed to manifest certain properties of those entities. This is one way that the practitioner reaches out to these powers for guidance or strength that they would not normally possess. And then there is Baphomet, one of the best known occult symbols which dates back to heresy and witchcraft trials of medieval times. It started with the order in 1118 and served as a protective symbol for the Christians when travelling in the Middle East. Baphomet is the well-known goat with the pentagram on his head. Once the Order and the various Christian groups which subscribed to Baphomet became large enough to be considered a political threat to the Church, the symbol changed hands and was banned from the Church through a series of political manoeuvres. In this time, this became a symbol of torture at the hands of the Church which was administered to heretics. Necropans are an extremely odd bit of occultism stemming from Iceland. They consist of the skin of the legs and feet of the dead and are worn by the living. In fact, the Icelandic people of the 17th century were infatuated with the rituals using the bodies of the dead, taking ribs here, skin from the sheep there, and mixing it all together into these nightmarish hodgepodge creatures that are left over to mortify us today. When it came to necropants, a sorcerer had to get the permission to use that person's skin as pants in order for it to be the right thing to do. This would apparently bring the wearer greatness, good fortune, and even wealth, supposing they could stomach the macabre ritual. At first, necropants were believed to be the things of myth, but many of them have now turned up and now reside in museums. Divination is the attempt to gain foresight and knowledge about the future through various methods from fortune tellers, to magic eight balls, to chance readings of a leaf or your palm. Psychics and tarot cards also fall under this category. Sometimes practitioners go to crystal gazing. Other times they stare into candlelight or even pools of water. The point of these latter practices is to use your guidance and intuition to let the necessary messages come to the practitioner and to gain some sense of spiritual understanding about future events. 
These practices have a long dark history of bloodshed and oppression at the hands of the church, which still sees divination as an evil incarnation of Satan. However, the occultist doesn't see it that way. Dating to St. Augustine of Hippo in the 5th century AD, who stated that any pagan traditions and religious practices were of the devil, the Christian church became increasingly brutal in its punishments of these practices. By the 13th century AD, any sort of divination or attempt to gain an understanding of future events was considered demon worship. Although Satanism and the occult aren't the same thing, both practices have borrowed heavily from one another throughout the centuries. The origins of true Satanism are quite mysterious, as the church has destroyed these cults rapidly wherever they popped up. But Satanic cults have been officially documented in Europe and North America as far back as the 17th century. Satanism finds at least some of its roots in dark figures, who are also synonymous with the occult throughout the centuries. Examples would be Hades, an ancient Greek god of the underworld, and Marduk. Thousands of years of worship of these figures has linked Satanism to occult practices, but these figures are technically pagan gods and not Satan himself. By the 20th century, Satanism was in full swing. The Satanic Church was established in America in the 1960s. Small cults have also sprung up worldwide. While the members of these groups don't number in the millions like those of other religions, the strange and sometimes violent practices like murder or suicide by Satanic cults make it a well-known movement. Despite their differences, Satanism and the occult are one and the same in the eyes of the Christian Church. Human sacrifice has occurred in some occult practices even to this day. In 1995, a 15-year-old girl named Elise Parler was lured to a eucalyptus grove and murdered. Her body was discovered eight months later. The suspects were 17-year-old Royce Casey, 14-year-old Joseph Fiorella, and 16-year-old Jacob Delishman. This murder had all the hallmarks of occultists or even satanic rape and killing. The teens returned to have sex with Parler's dead body over the ensuing weeks. When Casey confessed, he said that the rape and murder were sacrificial and for Satan. To the authorities, this was definitely an occult human sacrifice, but too unlike the ones of ancient times. Many such instances have popped up worldwide. There was a media frenzy about these types of murders in the 1990s in the United States. A notable one was a vampire cult led by Rod Ferrell and its ritualistic and sacrificial killings of Florida family. Ferrell was only 16 years old at the time of the murders. The teens in this cult took drugs, performed blood and sex rituals, and even travelled from Kentucky to Florida to kill Naomi Ruth Queen and Richard Windorf. Though rare, human sacrifice has definitely found its way into today's society, often as an exercise in occultism. Spells are technically recitals, words spoken by a practitioner to effect some sort of supernatural result. Tokens, charms and other instruments are not necessary for a spell to unleash supernatural powers and cause real world happenings. The true power of the spell is in its recitation and various practitioners, groups and societies have different opinions of what's proper. Some say that incantations need to be recited in a specific manner while the cultures have believed them to be more flexible. Throughout these centuries, in candlelit rooms, individuals have united in clandestine meetings to try to cause small or big changes in the course of the history through the utterance of words, which often terrified those who didn't believe in spells. These incantations run the gamut from red magic spells about love or passion to black magic spells that reveal the darker side of the human mind. Spells have been around since long before recorded history began. For ages, people have been using spells to render misfortune upon others. Some are for generally bad luck, while others are for revenge. Hundreds of hexes date to ancient times, such as ancient Egyptian death spells, which supposedly allow black magic practitioners to choose a cause of death in their victims. There are also nightmare spells where a practitioner believes that he can psychologically torment his victims by putting them through an endless stream of sleepless nights caused by dark, inhumane nightmares. With demonism, a practitioner seeks to summon the power of actual demons to bend to their will. 
According to Christianity and some occult practices, demons are fallen angels sworn to subvert all good things and to carry out only evil in the world. The Christian religion dating back to the times of the Holy Bible and the first etchings of the early Christians speak of these dark figures. Since ancient times, occultists have believed that they can harness these dark spirits to do evil. The practitioners have used ritualistic incantations to summon different demons for various purposes in many cultures throughout history. Starting from Satan, the leader of all demons, to Ukabak, the demon in hell, the Lord of Blood, who is believed to be responsible for humanity's most violent acts. Serial killers and brutal dictators have been thought to be under the control of this demonic influence, perhaps even causing most of humanity's atrocities. Icelandic magic is quite unique. In order to wake up a dead person, you have to shout out some poetry, some invocations, over the grave, and walk over the church graveyard, and spit on the grave. It can be quite nasty. It is the words or the language that are most important to get correct in order to get them up. And it's very dangerous because of course, once you get the dead man up, he's nine times stronger than he was in life. So you would never choose a very strong fisherman or farmer. You would choose a teenager or some guy who was not very strong. You have to fight a little bit with him once he gets up. You have to manage to put your head in front of his and lick up all the liquid that streams out of his nose and mouth and eventually clean him out with your own tongue. That's how you tame the beast. After that, you can tell him whatever he has to do. Once you send him on a person you dislike or is your enemy, the zombie is not only following him until his life is over, but he also follows the next seven generations. So it's a big revenge. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 No!